Northwest agents. Uh, fortunately, we have our own expert here in Glasgow, Giles Ruditi, who's not only organizing this wonderful meeting, but also pitch hitting for Dr. Liner. Giles. Thank you, Richard. So yes, uh, if you were expecting the president-elect of the ISMRM, you're sadly disappointed this morning. Uh, he sent me an outline of his talk, which I've uh, used and uh, ripped up and started again. <laughs> I have no uh, conflicts of interest for this talk. So the outline of the talk is there are different kinds of gadolinium-based contrast agents. I'm going to talk very briefly about their side effects and the difficulties we might have with administering them. Uh, talk about late reactions, which is something that happens after the patient has left the institution. Uh, something to do with recent developments in terms of regulatory changes and uh, what to do in pregnancy and a practical approach to safety and using of gadolinium-based contrast agents. The first thing I want to say though before I get into these details is that modern MRI contrast are very, very safe. Okay, so don't, don't take this the wrong way and uh, sleep tight at night when you're administering these things. Whatever we do in medicine, there's a risk versus a benefit. What we want to do is we want to minimize risk and maximize benefit for anything we want to do. Okay? And that way we can manage risk. This is the first contrast enhanced MRI done in the UK back in 1983, Graham Bidder at the Hammersmith. Um, just like in CT, which also happened in the UK, if we administer the contrast agent, it shows up the tumor much better than without the contrast. And contrast enhanced MRA, although you might not believe it, might have been invented in Leeds. Uh, this is the first paper in The Lancet uh, from Mohan and John Ridgway. And we can see this is a 2D acquisition, but it was during an infusion of uh, gadolinium DTPA, 1991. This is the first one we ever did in Glasgow. Well, one of the first ones we ever did in Glasgow when we first got a magnet that could do contrast-enhanced MRA. This is 1998. This was a revolution because up until that point, this patient would have needed a translumbar autogram. We would have had no way to image this patient otherwise. This was a real revolution. There was no spiral CT, helical CT. There was nothing like that. And of course, we now use it for all sorts of things, including, as you've just heard about, time-resolved MRA during infusion of contrast, where we can see arterial and venous phases in the one thing. But we know gadolinium is toxic. We know that it competes with calcium, and that if you just give gadolinium as an infusion, as, a, as an iron, then you're going to kill somebody. So we always chelate it. We always wrap it up in something to make it safe. Okay? And this is what we have in our armory, effectively, we have linear agents versus macrocyclic agents. Linear agents, the chelate, kind of wraps itself around the gadolinium atom, but it doesn't quite enclose it, okay? Whereas with a macrocyclic agent, which he used, uh, which are made with much higher pressures and more uh, convoluted chemistry, there's actually a ring, the, 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 it's actually a cycle around it, and the gadolinium is more contained and therefore you're going to have to get the gadolinium out, you're going to have to put more heat energy or whatever energy in there to actually get the gadolinium to dissociate from its chelate. In the early days this wasn't thought to be that important uh, and we concentrated on other structural and pharmacokinetic issues uh, between the different contrast agents like what their half-life was in the body and this kind of thing. But stability does have an effect and this is a different ways of measuring stability and what we've learned really is that the most important thing is the kinetic stability uh, and this is you know effectively this is measured in time as to how long things are going to dissociate for and as you can see the stability increases uh, with the complexity of the chelate so if you've got a macrocyclic chelate at the end there you're going to take a lot longer to get the gadolinium out than we have with a, a simple one so DTPA which was used for all the first ones Magnavis was the first trade name is a linear one you can make it in your kitchen these other ones are much more difficult to make if you need guidance this is the ACR manual on contrast guidance and this is a manual from the Euro European Society of Urogenital Radi Radiologists uh, the, the version 10 of that has just been published on the web. I was involved in that with Henrik Thompson, uh, and that's freely available off the web to look at. I'm not going to talk much about extravasation, just to say that it is the most common complication that we have from administering gadolinium-based contrast agents. It's uh, associated with poor venous access, uh, old ladies with poor quality veins, restless patients, 
Um, the implications are you get pain and swelling. Um, I've never had a patient who's had a gadolinium-based contrast agent to extravasation need plastic surgery, as I have had with iodine-based contrast media for CT, and that's because we don't inject very much. Although it's high prosmolar, it doesn't cause that much irritation to the skin, and we're not giving very much of it. So it's not usually a problem, other than the patient thinks that something's gone wrong. That's the main, the main thing. The patient feels that something's not gone right with their examination, they feel a bit disappointed. In terms of acute reactions, acute reactions are less common than they are for iodine-based contrast media. Uh, total incidence of side effects is less than 5% and there's no single adverse uh, event that has a frequency of more than 1%. Uh, you do get the taste in the mouth, the radiologist always advise patients they might get you know, a funny taste in the mouth or these flushing sensations, just as we do with infusing anything. If we put saline in quickly, we'll get funny sensations in the body. Life-threatening reactions, however, are much less common. Acute reactions we can divide into minor in that they don't interfere with the examination and they only require the patient to be reassured. Moderate reactions, uh, we might have to interfere with the examination, we might have to stop a sequence to reassure the patient. Severe reactions, obviously we're going to have to stop the examination and, that, and do something for the patient. And then the most severe reaction is death. Um, and it does happen, uh, but thankfully it's very rare. There are idiosyncratic and not idiosyncratic acute reactions. Most are idiosyncratic, so these are the kind of ones that we don't know that they're going to happen. Uh, the patient develops some urticaria, or as the Americans call it, hives. Uh, we treat these patients uh, symptomatically, uh, and if they've got anaphylaxis, then we're going to treat them uh, appropriately. And the important thing is to have in our departments a visible chart. This is the UK Resuscitation Council chart that we have laminated in most of our departments around the city uh, to show people what to do. The risk factors are previous, moderate and severe acute reactions um, to any other kind of contrast and asthma and atopy in the background of the history of the patient. As I say, the incidence is low um, and the risk of the reaction is not uh, related to the osmolality of the contrast agent or anything else. Non idiosyncratic reactions, uh, which we also see with both iodine and gadolinium based contrast agents, are more related to the actual chemical structure and therefore they're related to the dose. So if you're giving a lot of something, you're more likely to get a non idiosyncratic reaction. So we see this in CT, when we give a, a contrast bolus and suddenly a patient has an arrhythmia with a contrast bolus hitting the myocardium or something like that. Um, and you know, we, we, can't, we, we can't necessarily uh, prepare for that because it is non idiosyncratic. We, can't, we don't know who's going to get it. But again, because we're giving small amounts of contrast in, in terms of physical amount in MRI, uh, then we don't see these reactions too much. This is a systematic review recently published in radiology, uh, meta-analysis of uh, many other things. And the thing to take away from this is that these contrast reactions are very, very uncommon. There are some differences between the, what we call the non-ionic contrast agents and the ionic contrast agents for gadolinium-based, but uh, they're not clinically significant. We're not going to warn the patient any different for, between these agents because they're generally such a low incidence of reactions. The reactions, as you can see there, they do vary, but if you're doing 25 contrast and enhanced exams a day in your, in, your, in your magnet, you might see one to eight per year, so it, they are really pretty uncommon. As I say, there is differences between them, but in terms of clinical, uh, what we're going to warn patients, we're not going to warn them any different between these different agents. Who's going to get them? There is a, a greater incidence in female patients. The frequency is eight times higher in those who've had a prior reaction to something, and patients treated for asthma or A to P are at an increased risk, as I've said. There is no known cross-reaction between iodine-based contrast media and gadolinium-based contrast media. And similarly, between the gadolinium-based contrast media, if someone's had a mild reaction to a one in the past, you might want to avoid that, but we don't think there's necessarily going to be a link to another one. Quick word about post-contrast acute kidney injury, something we worry about in uh, using iodine-based contrast agents for CT and for angiography. It's not really an issue for MRI. If you get a case, you can probably write it up because we use such small amounts. Um, it used to be, uh, there's a marketing uh, message here from the past, from way, way back about Omniscan. Uh, it was marketed partly on the basis that it was thought it would have less reactions because it's non-ionic. Um, but in terms of acute kidney injury, it's not an issue. What is an issue with patients with renal failure is nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which you'll have all heard about. This is a definition from Carter Ruck solicitors in London. 
Um, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is an extremely rare but debilitating, painful, in a small percentage of cases, potentially deadly disease. First identified in 1997, cause not fully understood. It's associated with the administration of gadolinium contrast agents in severely renally impaired patients. This is a legal definition, not a medical definition. Um, but I think it's actually a very good definition, and the solicitors actually probably hit it on the na nail on the head with this one. We do have a medical kind of definition, and this is the Girardi criteria developed with uh, Sean Cowper, who's a dermatopathologist at Yale University, who first wrote about uh, NSF. And we make the diagnosis of the combination of clinical and pathological scoring. And if you've got a high clinical score and a pa high pathological score, you've got NSF. But you can have these kind of gray areas. There are gray areas in the diagnosis of NSF. And it, you can't diagnose it clinically alone. You can't diagnose it pathologically alone. You have to have the combination of the two. Our only experience in Glasgow, uh, which we published in radiology in a renal replacement therapy cohort, uh, this is some of our unfortunate patients, some more unfortunate than others. One of the ones on your bottom right there just had a, a skin thickening plaque on the thigh and it didn't really interfere with anything, whereas the other two did get joint contractures and uh, did in, in, indeed uh, have problems with NSF. The other thing to say about the distribution, we've had 18 cases, we think, in Glasgow in total over the years. Edinburgh's had one, Manchester none, Nottingham none, London none. So maybe there's something in the water up here. Um, don't worry if you're here from the States, something's going to affect you, but uh, there is something to do with either under-reporting but also other factors because it's clearly not a case that you just give a contrast agent to a patient in advanced renal failure and they will get NSF because most of the patients we gave triple dose Omniscan to who were on dialysis did not get NSF. But it is related to the stability of the contrast agents. We know that the patients with NSF were much more likely to have received the linear agents, particularly the non-ionic linear agents and that NSF with the macrocyclic agents is extremely rare. I have my doubts that there's any. There are a couple of case reports, uh, but I think it's pretty much unheard of with the macrocyclic agents. And again, it's to do with the, the stability of these agents that we're using. So the next issue, safety issue you may have heard of, is gadolinium de deposition in the brain. And this is a wee picture of Kanda. He's a, he's a shy man. He's not, he's not uh, ventured out of Japan, as far as I'm aware, to talk about his discovery. But he published in radiology uh, about high signal intensity in the dentate nucleus and globus pallidus on what were unenhanced T1 MR images. So I say they're unenhanced in that when the patient went into the magnet, they'd not received gadolinium just before going into the magnet. But they had, if he dug into the past, he found that he had had previous doses of gadolinium contrast in the past for other examinations. And this has set up a huge train, as a talk in itself, of uh, all sorts of uh, uh, papers over the years. Um, the main issue that people obviously latched onto was if you've got the signal deposition that's related to gadolinium accumulation in your dentate nucleus, maybe you're going to get Parkinsonism. This, I think, has been refuted by this very, very large study of a quarter of a million individuals uh, studied with uh, effectively one million patient years, uh, which showed that there is no incidence of increased Parkinsonism after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast agents for MRI, which is very reassuring indeed. There's no significant relationship. Having said that, we do know that lanthanum, for example, if we give lanthanum to patients, uh, then you cause, can cause lanthanum toxicity and you can get neurological syndromes. What we do know so far, this is a summary of the literature, which I'm not going to show you because it's as I said, I'll, I'll talk in itself, is that very low concentrations of gadolinium are deposited in the brain. They're deposited throughout the brain, cortex, white matter, everywhere, but they particularly deposit in the globus pallidus and the dentate nucleus. And we know that these are areas that are, are used for <coughs> uh, storing metals. I mean, if, if we've got copper, for example, in Wilson's disease and iron deposition in the basal ganglia, we know that these areas accumulate rare earth metals anyway. We also know that from electron microscopy that most of the gadolinium is deposited in perivascular tissues and much has not actually crossed the blood-brain barrier, though some has. Well, it may not have crossed the blood-brain barrier, but it's in the brain. How it gets there is a whole other story. It probably cr crosses the blood uh, ICSF barrier. It occurs, occurs with normal renal function, okay? So anyone getting a gadolinium contrast agent will get it. It is dose-related. The more gadolinium contrast you have, the more you will get. But the contrasts deposited, it be it in the brain or the bone or the liver or wherever, are much, much lower for the macrocyclic agents. 
We know this from post-mortem studies and biopsy studies. And we only see visible signal changes in the brain in patients who've had prior linear chelates. So if you've had a linear chelate, particularly the non-ionic chelates, uh, that's gadadiamide and uh, gadovacetamide particularly, then you're going to see high signal in the brain. You do not see high signal in the brain in patients who've had macrocyclic agents only, even if they've had multiple doses. There's strong evidence that for gadadiamide particularly, there has been decolation of gadolinium from its chelate, and that is what's happening. And it's probably visible because the concentrations that we see in the brain, even with large doses of gadadiamide over many years, shouldn't actually give you T1 shortening signal. You shouldn't be able to see it. The reason we're seeing it, we think, is because it's decolated from the chelate and it is bound to a larger macromolecule such as a transporter molecule such as neuromelanin which has got slower tumbling and therefore we get a, a signal effect and we're going to see that signal effect at lower field strength say 1 tesla and 1.5 more than we're going to see it at 3 tesla and 7 tesla. We know that there's no structural histopathological changes in the brains of patients who've got gadolinium on board from EM studies and we know that there's no deleterious clinical effects apparent. But it has changed the regulatory framework. This is what the ACR in the US says. It says don't deny contrast enhanced MRI examinations when they are really needed. But if you've got, uh, if you're going to use it in patients in terms of NSF, in patients who are at risk of NSF, that's for patients with advanced renal failure, you should use what the Americans call group one agents. And the, 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 the other, the, sorry, the group one agents, uh, which are the original linear chelates, non-ionics are all contraindicated. That's the current categorization in the US. In Europe, we also say we should not deny patients a contrast enhanced MRI exam when it's really needed, um, particularly when there's no alternative, but we should inform uh, the patient and the clinician of the potential risks, and we should use the lowest possible dose, i.e. less than 0.1 millimoles per kilogram. We used to have this in terms of what we thought were high risk agents, intermediate risk agents, and low risk agents, but following the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee recommendations to the European Medicines Agency, we have now, for MRA at least, uh, we've got rid of all the other agents. So in Europe, if you want to do MRA, you can only use a macrocyclic agent. So the liver agents, which are marketed as Primavist and Multihance in, in Europe, are still, a, uh, still available for liver imaging, but they're not uh, on label for using for MRA, so we can't use them for MRA anymore. So as I say, the, the, the PRAC confirmed recommendations uh, which came into force in Europe in February this year are that the linear agents that are left on the market, which are gadoxetic acid, primavist, and gadabenic acid, which is multi uh, can be used for liver imaging but not for anything else. All the other linear agents have been taken off market in Europe now and we can only use macrocyclic agents. So... There is a difference between where you practice. So if you're under the auspices of the FDA, you've got a slightly different position to what's happening in the EMA. So all the agents are still available in the US. They've all had their, their recommendations, although the package inserts changed, and they all have uh, a statement, as I put at the bottom there, that linear gadolinium-based contrast agents cause more retention than macrocyclic gadolinium-based contrast agents. But if you hand this leaflet to the patient, they don't know whether they've got a linear agent or have been given a macrocyclic agent. It's a bit odd, actually. Um, but anyway, so there are differences across the pond, but we knew there were differences across the pond. So what's the current status? We should use the lowest dose. There's a calculator from Wisconsin there. Low dose imaging is possible. This is uh, very low dose imaging from Paul Finn for superaortic arteries, published at 3T. Uh, and Tim has uh, also published quite a lot on using low dose for peripheral MRA, even for multi-station MRA using single dose uh, at 1.5 and 3T. Quick word about MRI in pregnancy, if I've got a minute left. The incidence of stillbirth is not significantly higher in patients who've had an MRI scan in the first trimester of pregnancy, and the incidence of congenital anomaly is not significantly higher. So that's reassuring recent evidence out of Canada uh, that shows that MRI in the first trimester of pregnancy is safe. That's MRI. MRI with contrast, however, is a different kettle of fish. There is thought to be an incidence of stillbirth that is significantly higher. There doesn't seem to be a difference in instance of congenital anomalies, 
but there is emerging evidence that there might be an increased incidence of inflammatory rheumatological type skin conditions and other things in children who've been exposed in utero to gadolinium contrast agents. But we don't know the, the, what contrast agents were given here in these population studies, and we don't know uh, really the outcome of that. So there's still quite a lot of open questions uh, that we don't know about. But basically, the message is that if we know that the patient is pregnant, then we should not use gadolinium-based contrast agents unless absolutely necessary. And we should try and avoid them. In terms of safe, practical gadolinium-based contrast agent use, we should always confirm that gadolinium-based contrast agent use is uh, actually needed. And, you know, we shouldn't just give it willy-nilly just because it's part of a protocol. We always give it. We should know that. We should have trained staff who can deal with reactions, identify our at-risk patients. We should put an adequate can caliber cannula in. We should adjust our contrast doses to the minimum, and we, that means weighing our patients, knowing how much they weigh. And uh, we should also record and document which contrast agent we've given, how much we've given, uh, and why we gave it. And we know that gadolinium can be retained in patients even with normal renal function, so any of us will retain gadolinium. I've had gadolinium contrast for, re for just for research studies, so there's mostly some kicking around inside of me. Um, and the last thing is that there's new evidence that first trimester pregnancy MRI is okay. And with that hopefully reassuring message, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giles. Nice balanced talk on uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents.